Before we get started too far in the service today, we wanna, I want to pray for a young man that grew up through our church, and he's going to college and on a mission and doing some things in Europe. So he leaves, is it Tuesday, Noah? Is it Tuesday? So come on up, Noah, and whoever else wants to gather around him, you know, he's kind of sent from here. He's going to school, ministry school and things over there. He's lear- he, he knows five languages. So he's all versed, and he's learning now Greek and Latin. So we, we just want to pray for this, this God-appointed young man. Turn around and, and show the bow tie, and he look hip. Wow, and he doesn't wear socks. He never wears socks. It's, it's just not in my wheelhouse, but he's a great young man. We love him, and he's favored son in the house. So gather around him. Why don't we all stand and stretch your hands towards this, this great God. God, we just pray right now as he goes, he goes sent, he goes blessed, that, Lord, we support him in every aspect that we possibly can. You bless him and protect him. Bring right people across his pathway for him to witness and share to, but also to be a provincial voice towards his life. Open doors, supernatural pathways, clearly cut out. We thank you, Father. We thank you for this wonderful vessel, this young man that's given his life over to you, and that you supply, provide, help him, and to stay connected. We just pray for him right now. Thank you for it. And God, I pray that he will stay connected with the Internet with us and not leave us hanging in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, give him a hug and everything, and then we're going to find our seats. Praise the Lord. Find your places, everybody. Praise the Lord. Well, we have just uh, a, a unique thing has happened if you're, if you're visiting or new to our house today. This fall, we've been having a series of missionaries and, and people come our way. And we didn't, like, in, 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 uh, construct it. We didn't build it. We didn't formulate it. It's just kind of a God thing. How many like God things happening? Two weeks ago, we had Joe Hernandez, missionary to Dubai. United Emirates. He started a church. He can't call it a church. He calls it a leadership meeting. But he goes over there and he preaches the gospel. He has guys posted out there if, if new people come up and come into the service and things. Because if they preach the gospel over there, he's arrested. And he's, uh, he's beaten. I mean, like a lot of things can happen. But you know what? When you're called of God and you're graced, that's where you want to be, Right? See, I'd rather be in Dubai with the grace of God than I would downtown L.A. without it because it's a mean place as well. So uh, we, we, in the sequence of that, we just had Joe and Mary who haven't been here for uh, a year or a year and a half or so. And uh, whenever we get a chance to have our missionaries come, we like to have them come because the church needs to know the, the, what God is doing around the world. How many know we get kind of like isolated? We just kind of get rolling around our neighborhoods and our streets and things. We focus in on our everyday, and we sometimes lose that God's a big God, and he's got a lot of things going. And you know what? They're not half-baked. They're not troublesome. They're not just struggling. It's not menial. God is a big God, and he's doing big things all around the world. We just don't hear about it because our eyes are on, you know, the terra firma right in front of us. So Joe and Mary coming gives us an insight of what happens around the world. So I'm going to have, like we did with Joe, a little Q&A time, and then Brother Joe is going to share, or Mary, however they wanted to work it. But uh, to let you know what missionaries do and what they go through, we have a whole generation that has no idea what missionary means. They, they know what, you know, our churches and, and, and local things, but I'm telling you, God is a big God, and he gives apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and we know, uh, we need to know more about what God's apostles or missionaries are doing around the world. So, I want us to just greet them warmly as Joe and Mary come up and and have time with us today. I'm going to grab them a microphone. I think we can greet them a little bit better than that. Praise the Lord.
before I, I have some questions, and they're gonna we're just kind of let that go and what they have in their heart. That's Joe and that's Mary. Making sure. So, you know, the, the Bible says that, that, that well, our, uh, mankind says that the human uses 10 to 15% of their brain. That they could, you know, advance more. They could think better. They could think more, broaden their scope, learn more. So that means there's a lot of it that's really not enacted. And the same thing in, in comparison is the church is not living up to its potentials. We kind of just take care of our own, and so many people are, well, I want my church to grow, and I want my finances to be met, and all of that. And the cost of that is that the world is not reached with a gospel that will change every life if they want to. We've recently had some real testimonies. One of the couples said in the church today that they were driving down Post Street, on, on a, and there was a, there was a bridge and there was a girl about to jump off last night. And they stopped the sister, the mom, got out of the car and talked the lady down. They called the police, and they, they took her to some help to get her out of that. You know, we need to have that interaction in our lives every day instead of just thinking, what do I do to get my coffee and my donut? And no troubles. God is a big God. How many know that's true? God's a big God. So let, let's... Uh, Take what God is trying to do here and expand what uh, he, our potentials are as a church. We can do far more than what we've done. But we have to be engaged. We have to light the fire. Say amen. So with directing out with um, Joe and Mary, um, we've known them for decades now. And they, to a little bit of the story, for time's sake, is that he graduated from Gonzaga here. And then went to uh, Seattle in a, a firm, was it? Well, I stayed here. You stayed here? Okay. Yeah, I stayed here for eight years. Well, you tell the story because I'm messing it up. Uh, so I, I went I to... Make it up as we go. So. <laughs> I went to law school at Gonzaga uh, after UW and uh, was here eight, eight years until Mary and I got married. And then six months later, we moved to Alaska and I got a, a different job up there uh, with a law firm. And then... God called you out of that to go to Bible school. Right. Uh, I practiced law. You know, if you include the time you clerk and intern, it was almost 14 years. And so in 1986, we responded to the call of God and went down to Rhema. While he was going to bio, uh, law school here, our church was existing, but he never came to our church. I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know it was here. No, I just, None of you came and got me. <laughs> it's your fault, then. Just say it. Amen. So, anyways, so after, you know, in this process, and there's many stories along the way, you went to Bible school, and then you felt to go back to Alaska. Yeah, we went back to Alaska. It's not where I wanted to go, actually, Pastor. Uh, I had been to Peru on a missions trip for Rema, and I really wanted to be called to someplace warm. And I couldn't talk God into it, and the only place I had a leading was to go back to Alaska where we had been. And that turned out to be the cradle of our ministry, really. So you were in, in Alaska just a short time, working there, and then felt the doors open to go to Russia. Yeah, uh, we got back there in 89. Uh, I started traveling out into the bush uh, to minister. I was an associate pastor. And I was doing mission work out in the um, Arctic and subarctic regions of Alaska with Eskimo people and uh, Indian people. And uh, I was at a conference in Tulsa uh, in about 1990. And a friend of mine said, have you ever thought about going into Russia from Alaska? I never had. I didn't even know it was possible. Uh, but when I got back to Alaska about two weeks later, I got talking to an Eskimo uh, lady, a Christian lady in Anchorage who told me that there was a missions trip, a church was going to put a missions trip together to go into that tip of northeast Russia. That's called Chukotka. And um, I called that missions director because I knew him. He's a friend of mine. And I said, can I go with you? And he said, no, because they didn't want to restart the visa process. It took a long time to get your visa to go into Russia. So I said, fine, you know, I'm a lawyer. I know how to paddle my own canoe. And it turned out I went. They never did. They never did get their visas. But, but through that Eskimo woman in, no in, in Anchorage, she connected me with another Eskimo family in Nome, 
and I was told they had, they were reindeer herders and they had contact with reindeer herders in that part of Russia. And, and so they arranged for me to go over there in 1991. I made my first trip into that part of the world. So here, here's what we as a church, we need. Most churches, and I did try to do a little research and never found it, but mission support in many of our contemporary churches is minimal. And what do they do? They just look here. And you know what? God wants to save the world, not just, you know, our backyard. So what I need us as a church, what I'm compelled to is us to know that God is a big God, and we need to invest in that more than we are because that's what God wants us to do. So sometimes we think missionaries, they have like an escalator that fast tracks them to the like prime spot for uh, uh, ministry. But I tell you, they have to struggle, walk, believe God, and push walls just like you do in your everyday life, for your life, for your, your uh, health, for your marriages, for your family, and for your finances. And even though it's more escalated for them. So you went over and got connected and went into Russia. Tell us about that open door and the start of that. So I did not know anyone in Russia. I didn't know Russian. I don't know, I don't know what I was thinking, how I was, how I was going to talk to those people. Uh, I had a Berlitz travel book. I knew how to say yes, no, hello, goodbye, uh, thank you, I'd like a drink of water, and the most important phrase any missionary can learn, where is the bathroom? And so you can tell I was eminently prepared to preach the gospel to those people. Uh, I met with Pastor Rick. There was about maybe four families represented that, that the people that invited me to stay in their home, they invited about maybe five, six of their friends, and it was for four, five, four nights, five days. I just shared the gospel with them. I, I shared what I knew. And... Uh, and that's how it got started. The, the person, the, I, I, when I asked them if they'd like to receive Jesus, just two people responded. Uh, one was an, a woman named Larissa and then her daughter, Natasha. And um, now, what, 19, 20 years later, Larissa is still pastoring the church that we started up there. What city was that again? It's called Providenia. And that was my first trip. I made a couple more in there, took the Jesus film, showed the Jesus film in the theater, and shared the gospel in the schools. It wasn't until 1992 that we made the leap over there with our family and kids. But it was also what came out of that small beginning with that small group is not only did Larissa become the pastor of the church that we started there, but, but there were like six different outreaches in six different villages right. that started churches. Um, and Larissa, still today, she's our age, and still today travels out to those villages by snow machine and, and dog sled and um, different things to preach yeah. the gospel. It's about 160 miles south of the Arctic Circle, so it's some of the most re remote real estate on the face of the earth. And, and Mary's right, about five or six churches were uh, planted out of the church that we planted, directly or indirectly. Uh, our missionaries that we raised up or we gave uh, aid and support to people starting uh, churches out there. And, and to get to these places, you've got to either go by a helicopter that's not on a schedule, so they might drop you out there, but you don't know when they're coming back. In the summer, you could take a whale boat, but the whale boats had a tendency to get overloaded because everyone wanted to travel at that time, and they would sink. I mean, it was, it was real tragedies. Or, or a Vista Hawk, which is a personnel carrier. So uh, it, it, it's just miles and miles of nothing, you know. Polar bears, wolves. <laughs> so when, when we hear these stories, we started these churches and, and these people were healed and these things happened, we don't see some of the other things that we need to appreciate. I, I titled this little se sequence, The Secret Lives of Missionaries, because there's things behind the curtain that we don't see. When they went over there, their youngest of four children was 19 months and their oldest was eight years, eight years old. old. And so they went over into um, 30 years ago settings, uh, housing and things. So tell us a little bit about what housing was like, what life was like, what it was taking those kids to these 
these places? What? Well, when we arrived, um, you know, we're driving this old Russian truck that's taking us to our, our place where we're to live. And we come in, and it, it, driving through the town, it looked like World War II just happened there. And, yeah, it, was and more than thir it, it looked it more like about 60, like 1930 yeah, is what it, it, it looked, frozen in time. It was, it was bad. So we get into our, our little apartment, and, um, you know, it's got this old, old red wallpaper that's tearing down, and we see cockroaches all over the place. And, and the beds, what the beds that they had, um, you know, were these, these springy things, and, and the mattresses, thin mattresses, all smelled like urine because uh, they didn't have um, diapers then, and they didn't even have cloth diapers because they had no rubber pants for cloth diapers. So um, we had to bring in a supply of, of our of own diapers because my 19-month-old was still in diapers. But um, then the water came came out of the tap black in the morning, and by afternoon it'd be a dark orange. So and they didn't sell bottled water. So at we got there, we didn't even have water to drink. We had brought a water distiller with us, but we had to wait for that water to produce some drinking water before we could drink anything. Um, uh, very, very, very little food in the shops. We brought over, uh, you know, n nine months worth of, the, uh, of staples. I would spend the summers uh, drying fruit and vegetables to bring over. I brought over a nine-month supply of peanut butter so the kids could have peanut butter once a week. <laughs> and um, just yeah, what? There, there was... Um, oh, I know. It took six hours to do one little wash. Yeah, because yeah. you had to filter that yeah. water out with cotton, and American yeah. cotton wouldn't filter it. It wasn't yeah. thick enough. The Russian cotton could filter out the sediment, yeah. and you didn't need to purify that to wash clothes or wash the floor, but what we drank and it. cooked with, we, we distilled. Um, yeah, Mary Mary is a, a, a expert mover because she was planning, she had <laughs> planned nine months in advance, not only for meals, but clothing and growth spurts, so shoes, you know, uh, eight, six, four, three boys and a little baby, and she had to plan for growth spurts, uh, clothing, shoes, birthday presents, Christmas presents, and and so we had to get all that to Nome and then get it yeah. loaded onto a little plane that we would charter, like a twin-engine Navajo or something like that. We had to bring powdered eggs. We couldn't yeah. get eggs. We had to bring powdered milk, couldn't get milk. Pea um, soup. We... Mary's the only one in the family that still likes pea soup. <laughs> um, we, <laughs> we had spam. We had, we <laughs> had, we had, for our anniversary one year, we had potatoes au gratin, you know, like they're the free packaged. Fresh, and spam. Yeah. That, was our, that was our anniversary dinner. So uh, from, from that city, and there's a lot of stories in there. How many years were you there? They're about, Almost. you know, about six. We're tw 12 years all told in Russia. Six years. So you went eight and six. So John was 14 when you moved to the next city, which was? Uh, which was Khabarovsk, which is down near China. It's about 25 miles from China in the Russian Far East. Uh, probably 800 miles north of North Korea, down over on that side of the world, the Pacific Ocean side. And um, we helped start Bible school there, did leadership training, then we took over a church that was really failing and got it back on its feet, got it out of debt, and, and um, finally, and I, and I started doing missions work out of Russia, not only into Siberia, but also into China, wow. and Nepal, and things like that, while we were based in Habarsk, yeah. and then eventually we turned that over to a young couple that uh, we knew from Providenia, the, the, the wife was she was about 14 at that time. She was in our church. And a 16-year-old, 17-year-old boy from America came. His parents were going to start a Christian school. They, and so they dropped him off. And they never got back. So he, he's supposed to be living with this Russian family. And they had given the family money to feed him. And they weren't feeding him. I mean, he was like a stray cat. He's just a skinny little guy. You would, and and he, he uh, fell in love with, with Inga. Well, they met in our church. And gradually got married, went off to Raymond, and joined us in Avaris. And they have pastored that church since we left for Singapore in, when did we leave? 2004. Mm -hmm. So, and they did a phenomenal job with that. Yeah. So, 
what we need to keep appreciating is <coughs> the living conditions, the external obstacles that all of us face that we don't think they face. We get a hold of the, the spiritual triumph, but we don't have the uh, understanding that they have to walk by faith with a urine uh, tainted home, roaches everywhere, powdered uh, milk, powdered potatoes, everything powdered. I'm, you know, that would push my flesh. How about you? <laughs> but they're doing these things because of the Holy Spirit's compelling and pulling. Tell us a little bit about the Holy Spirit's draw on the inside of you, in spite of all of the uglies, living conditions. Well, actually, that time in the Arctic was the happiest years, family years, uh, of all our happy years. Uh, we were so close. And we were close to the people. Uh, and, and we did not have a spectacular vision or a, a, anything, no goosebumps or anything. It's just a matter, just like you, just praying and keep your Bible open and pray and read the Word. And gradually we came to the conclusion we should go to the Arctic. And, and then when it was time, we... The Lord was faithful to tell us about two years in advance, it's time to turn this work over. We knew that if we stayed, we would actually hinder that work, but that if we turned it over, we knew, like I would tell them, if, if we go, it'll grow. And it did. So, yeah. I was going to say, um, you know, when we first got there, it was a very difficult <coughs> adjustment, I think mainly for me and the children. Um, I remember a time he was so happy. He's, he's on the mission field. He loved the dirt and the mud and everything, life. you know. And I'm, lo I'm with the kids looking. At, there's no food here, you know. So, and uh, and uh, I, I remember just praying, oh, Lord, uh, he's happy. You need to make me happy. And, um, but when it came time to leave that place, when the Lord led us to a different place, Still today, I, I think in the ministry, it was the hardest thing we ever did was to leave that place because it was just such a precious time, both for the family and for, for the people that we met there. Yeah. Our connection in Habarisk, I, I know we use this word a lot. It, it becomes trite, a cliche. It was a divine appointment, and I won't go into that, but how I met the main pastor I met there was really supernatural. But when we got there, I felt a, a lot of the times we were like in some kind of transition. And sometimes I wondered, why, why did we come here? And, and, and yet, we still are connected with a lot of those people today. Mm -hmm. And looking back, we can see how God did that, what he did in that situation. And then again, Pastor Rick, about six years into that, we knew we had a knowing on the inside, it's time to turn this over. But I didn't know where we were supposed to go. And so it's happened a lot like that. You know, I, if, you know, if you think that missionaries have some inside channel where they, you know, they get the angel Gabriel comes and tells them, it didn't work that way for us, maybe for some of them. But it was just a matter of uh, staying consecrated, committed, you know, just, just praying, just spending time praying and in the word and asking God, Lord, direct us. And that's when um, Singapore, and it took me about two or three trips down to Singapore before we figured out, not, that's where the next place is. And so, uh, and, and Pastor, I want to I just say this. Do you know that I think in every place we've been, personally, I feel like I've received more from the people than I gave them. From the Eskimo, the Indian people, the Chukchi people, the Russian people, the Russian Christians, the Chinese. I'm telling you, there's incredible Christians in the world. And you go and you feel like, man, uh, they've given, you, they, what am I here for? They've given you so much. There are amazing Christians all over the globe. Yes, yes. And God's doing amazing things. There's brilliant people out there. So you know, for us that, you know, you may think, I, I would never go to Russia, and you probably won't. But God put Russia in your heart. And your outside man can talk you out of a divine, a, a divine place. And so there's things in your life that you say, why would I do that? It's because there's a grace of God on the inside of you you've got to listen to. Mm -hmm. And you are what you are by the grace of God. But So don't let living conditions or, or external things talk you out of a divine appointment. Like I said, I would rather be in Russia 
with the grace of God than downtown L.A. Mm -hmm. without it. So tell, tell us real briefly, last question. Um, what would you like for Americans to appreciate, know, comprehend that they may not from, you know, the secret lives of a missionary? That's, hmm. um, what, would, what would it be? I guess one thing is to know that people over there are really no different from you. I mean, we all laugh the same and cry the same. We live, we die, we laugh, we cry. Uh, everybody that doesn't know Jesus all over the world is unsaved. And... Um, and so that's, that's one thing. I mean, the, 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 uh, what, what missions brings to you is, is the idea that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I think another thing is that I, I hope, Pastor and we were talking last night, you know, that, that what helped move us in toward the plan of God for our lives was hearing things like this, uh, it wasn't because we felt guilty. It wasn't because we felt guilty that we went and did this. I think it was Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, who said, the grace of God will never leave you where, uh, the will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you. And though we had outwardly some very difficult situations, quite frankly, planting a church in Arctic Russia right after the Soviet era, uh, it was, you know, it was like trying to dig into concrete. And the weather, severe, there was lots on the outside that could discourage you, just like there is in your lives. But the grace of God kept us. We were happy in God. And one way we gauged things was, <clears throat> oh, do we have grace to do this? Yeah. <clears throat> and so, so I think if somehow Americans could not think of missions something way, way out there, but it's something in here, and uh, folks out there, the unsaved out there, are like the unsaved in your neighborhood. And, and whatever God puts in your heart to do, he'll give you grace to do it. Amen. <clears throat> there was a time I remember when we had um, no heat and no hot water for two weeks, and it was 27 below zero. And I remember one morning going into the bathroom and thinking, oh, God, please let there be hot water. And there was none. And I cried and I just knelt down by that tub and said, oh, Lord, if, if there's supposed to be the grace, why is this so hard? And, and, the, and he spoke to me and, and gave, told me, you know, the grace wasn't that the answer. The grace was the strength to get through to the answer. And, and, it, and it was just, it just was life-changing for me in that, in realizing that grace. And it, not long after that, the hot water did come on, but... But as a missionary, we, we see that is, as your, a missionary is happy in the grace of God. You don't need to feel sorry for a missionary as long as they're in the grace of God. But so much so, they appreciate, we have appreciated the support of those back home. It means the world. It has always meant the world to us. Just the little things that, that people do to us, knowing that they're giving to help us do what we're doing. We're not alone in this. It's all of you. It's all of you doing. We could not do it without all of you. And so just little things that people have done. People sent little gifts for the children or something for Christmas or just, you know, they go the extra mile and it, it means the world to a missionary. We're going to give Joe a chance to share a little bit of the gospel with us today. Some of the things on his heart. Uh, I, I believe a missionary, an apostle, has a viewpoint and a perspective that the church needs to hear. And so we're going to give him a few minutes. Does that sound okay? So we'll let Tupe bring his thing up, and Mary can go down. And we'll let him that. So did you appreciate the Q&A time, sir?
Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for our time together. Thank you for the, the thank you for Jesus most of all. I ask you to speak to us and through us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. You know, before I found out the pastor wanted to do this interview, actually I had uh, plan to share along this line anyway, and so it dovetails nicely, and I'm, I'm uh, going to continue along this line that we had talked about, but I want to preface it with this. <clears throat> this is actually the third time this, like since June, June, July, August, it's the third time that I have shared this testimony in a church, and uh, the first time in a long time was when I was in Connecticut in June. And we've, we've just been here three weeks on this trip. And I, I just t want to tell you that the pastor, who is a great, wonderful man of God, I've known for a long time, and he asked me to share this testimony. And if I can be just transparent with you, I was reluctant. I used to share this testimony, and I stopped because I didn't think... Now, I always thought Mary did heroically. I mean, really, for a mom to do that, to take her kids into that kind, our kids into that situation, I just have such admiration for Mary to, to do that. And she wasn't raised that way. She'd never been out of the country when she met me. She thought she was marrying a lawyer and that we're, we were going to have a, a nice house with a white picket fence. And um, she did ask me before we got married, you don't like to travel, do you? And, and I mean, ever since we said I do, we've been... We've been traveling. So uh, I just appreciate Mary, but I didn't think I'd done anything special. And actually, I, I think of something Brother Hagen said many years ago. I heard him say, you know, and i trying to remember. I, I may not get this exactly right, but I think wh what he was doing is kind of reminiscing. And, and I think he said this, and I can say this. He said, when I was younger, you know, I thought he did a pretty good job. You know, he pastored before he went into worldwide traveling ministry. And he said, I thought he did a pretty good job. But he said, now, I said, I look back and he said, like, you could almost hang your head in shame uh, because you, of, of what you didn't know and what you could have done and didn't do and should have done and didn't do and what you could have done better. And I have to say that I have felt that way too. When I look back, I realize I was nowhere near as smart and as spiritual as I thought I was. And... You know, I thought of all the other the, the things I could have done and I could have done better, you know. So I wasn't really eager to share this testimony. And when the pastor in Connecticut asked me, of course I said yes, because he's the pastor. But I felt the Lord speak to me and tell me, this is not about you. This testimony is not about you. This is about me. This is about God. And I want to share with you from, from that perspective on that first trip that I made in, mm, I guess it was 98, 91, and I stayed with that family, um, you know, after I shared the gospel with them as best I could, the, the, the hostess, who was an educated woman, she was a dentist, uh, she looked up with tears in her eyes. When I, I had told them everything I knew, she looked up with tears in her eyes. I, I, I said, Did, do, would you like to receive Jesus now? And she looked up and she said, how wonderful that you came. There you were in your own country with your own life, but God sent you to us. It's as though we were blind, but now we see. And, and I have to say that in almost, you know, in 29, almost 30 years of ministry, those are some of the most wonderful words I've ever heard. But it makes me think about Jesus and how blind the world is without him. You know, it's not just those Russian people who, by the way, they had never heard the gospel. And the church that we planted there was, as far as we know, the first church in history in that easternmost part of that easternmost region of Russia. There were other churches farther in. It's a place, it, that region's about the size of Texas. But where we were, I, I don't think there had ever been a, any evangelical church. And so it was the first time they, they heard the gospel. But you know what? They're not the only ones that are blind. I, I mean, anybody that doesn't know Jesus anywhere. But, but, but the scripture also says, actually, it's not just unbelievers that, that are blind. Peter, in 2 Peter, is telling the people, 
you know, he said, you know, to your faith add virtue or excellence and knowledge and godliness and brotherly, you know, a, a brotherly affection and love. He said, add these things so that your life in God is, is not uh, uh, ineffectual. I'm paraphrasing. And he said this, he said, for whoever lacks these qualities of godliness and so on, this steadfastness, he said, whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind. Now, why? Having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. And, and so that's not just a condition of the unbeliever. Obviously, they don't know which way to go. But even for we Christians, you know, we can have spiritual glaucoma. And, and it's interesting, he doesn't say make a list of 17 things so that you can be holier and more godly and all this. The root of the, where the fruit comes from, he says, they have forgotten that they were cleansed from their former sins. And, and this is true of, of many, many believers. You, you will find that their degree of fruitfulness is proportionate to the degree of which they live in that awareness of, of what Jesus has done. And so, you know, when that woman said that to me, I, I could say that to Jesus. You know, I, I could sing the song, I, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. He is the light of the world and the light that lightens every man. Well, and, and, and by the way, the word that God spoke to those people, the gospel, and the word that he speaks to us, it, does, it really does two things. The, the, the reason why Jesus is the light of the world is that he lights up our sinfulness, our sinful condition, so that we know we need to be saved. And he lights up the righteousness of God is, that is that free gift to those that believe in him. And so, uh, you know, like the scripture in Samuel says, he kills and makes alive. He kills the old Adam so that he can raise us to new life in Christ. And, and we ought to always remember that. Always remember that. It's the root of the fruit of the Spirit. Well, eventually, after I made three trips into that place, we began to make preparations to come. We, we decided this is what we should do. We should go back there. Many people had, had gotten saved, but they had no pastor. And so... Um, we, we were preparing, and, and as, you know, Pastor said and Mary said, the kids were small, and um, it, it's cold up there, you know. It, it, not off always, but it can drop to, you know, not, not unusual for it to be minus 10, minus 15, but it can get down to minus 20, minus 30. And if you add 30 miles an hour wind to minus 25 degrees Fahrenheit, it feels like minus, about minus 90 so it's real cold. And um, um, another pastor that went with me up there said, you, you can't bring your family into these conditions. You know, it, it, was, it was that bad. In the, in the spring, it, it, they call it break up because the frozen ground breaks up and it just turns to a sea of mud. So hi, my wife is a hero. She's heroic. And uh, there was a judge in that town that, found out I was a lawyer, and, and of course, you know, doctors, lawyers, whatever, carpenters in different countries, you're kind of curious about how you ply your trade and so on and so forth. So she invited me to come. She invited us to come to her courtroom during one of their uh, criminal trials, actually, and, uh, you know, professional courtesy. And this is a woman, a well-educated woman who's grown up on atheistic materialism and communism. Later, she said to me, when I saw that you brought your most precious treasure into these conditions, she said, that's when I knew that you were sincere and I received Jesus. Well, we didn't know that would make an impression on people. Um, but again, I, no missionary has done what Jesus did. I think about Jesus. What was it like to come from a place of, you know what, we just, we do not have the mental capacity to know what heaven is like. It is, it is beyond the mind of man. What is it like in a place of infinite purity, holiness, infinite holiness, infinite love, 
always everywhere, all around. What is it like to come into a world that not only physically is inferior, but, you know, to, to come and dwell among a crooked and perverse generation. I know we don't, we don't think of ourselves that way, but there's a, there's a selfie of us in Romans chapter 3. If you, if you want a self-portrait, I mean, frankly, I read it. I, it's hard for me to believe. I'm, I'm being honest with you. I'm a missionary many, many years, and every time I read this, I think, no. <laughs> but it says, Romans 3, 10 to 18, none is righteous, no, not one. This is, this is a condition of fallen humanity. Thank God if you're, uh, if you're in Christ, you're saved, you're redeemed, but this is who Jesus came to dwell with. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. I mean, he's not mincing words. No one does good. Wait, wait a minute. I thought I was a good sinner. I really did. I never would say that, I, but I really felt I'm a nice sinner. I'm not a bad sinner like you guys. I'm a nice sinner. I was, I was in the church I grew up, I was an altar boy. I mean, we wore black robe and a white robe, and those robes would hang in, the, in a part of the church where they'd keep the incense. And I'm telling you what, you'd put those robes on over your clothes, and when you go home, you even smelled holy. And so I thought, I'm a nice sinner. I, don't, I, I really felt, uh, I, I would go to full gospel businessmen and hear the testimonies of these bikers who had killed 25 guys and robbed 30 banks and you know, and I'm thinking, boy, how do you beat that? I, they weren't that bad, but they had some spectacular testimonies. And I thought to myself, again, I didn't articulate it, but I thought it was almost like Jesus only had to half save me as much. He didn't need to save me as much as other people. And so when I read this, I, I mean, something in my flesh, the old Adam still wants to cry out like, no, 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 no. But, you know, like Brother Hagin said, the flesh never gets saved. And so even though you're a new creation, you know, that, that old Adam, he's a stinker. And he just, he never gets sanctified. So, so it says, their, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive and so on. I mean, it's glorious. And this is what Jesus came to. And people hated him. And they plotted against him. And they slandered him. And they wanted to murder him. And, and you know, what was it like? Well, I think if people understood that the Father sent his most precious treasure into these conditions, they might get saved. It's, it's not all about us. It, it's really about Jesus. One of the, some of the things we, d we did not talk about, and as Mary and I have shared this recently, we thought about some of the stuff that we just never talked about much that was pretty wild. I mean, a, a couple times our children's lives really were at risk because the medical care there was so bad. Russian believers are well-developed in their faith for healing because many times the doctor would make them worse or really, really injure them. And I won't go into that, but there was, I think, like a salmonella thing that went through our little town. Do you, do you understand this is a town of about less than 5,000 people, maybe 3,000 people, and it's on the tundra. It's a barren Arctic outpost, rocks and snow and ice. And in the summer, the summer, they really have two seasons, cold and colder, but for two months, it gets less cold. And uh, you would not want to go to the hospital there, and you don't just hop the next... Uh, Alaska Airlines flight out of town, it can take weeks. And the airport can be shut down because the weather is horrific. And so, uh, you know, this, this food poisoning thing from bad eggs went through. And I mean, I was concerned because like, like my third son, he just didn't have enough weight to lose. People just can get s lose so much weight, it's dangerous. And deathly pale, the, the three kids. I don't think Katie ever got it. Mary got it. And, and had to be put on a, a, an IV. 
And then another time down south in Russia, my son got, I don't know the medical term for this, but when an infection spreads under the skin and, and the red begins to spread. And I, we have a, my brother-in-law is a doc in the States. He's a medical doctor. And he said, well, you know, what do we do? We had some antibiotics with us. And he said, take these and then take a ballpoint pen and draw a circle around that red spot. And he said, and if it keeps going, he said, get him out of there. So, but, but again, you can't just hop the next plane and get him out of where, you know? Um, well, traveling there, as I mentioned, was a challenge. Those these jihads, they're like half-track vehicles. They're like tanks, uh, they're, but they're personnel carriers. And that was how we got around, but that is iffy because in winter, the drivers can get drunk. They might be drinking vodka. Uh, they can get lost in a snowstorm. They can go too far out on the sea ice. The okay, here's, here's, here's the picture. These communities, th this is on the Ar um, Bering Sea. It's got other names, Kotzebue Sound, Norton Sound, but it's basically the Bering Sea. And these fjords, these bays, sometimes separate these villages. And so in the winter, it's frozen hard enough that these vehicles can go across. But sometimes the drivers would get disoriented and go too far out on the sea ice and you know, plunge through. Uh, one time we were crossing to go to another village, and I did things back then I would never do now. I mean, I, I, I would just, I was not heroic, I was ignorant. I just did not know the danger that, that it was. But we're crossing the ice, and the tide is coming in, and I didn't know, I thought that water always stayed under the ice, but it doesn't. And the, the seawater is coming in over the ice, and it's coming up the treads of the Vistahad. Now, I'm not a mechanic, but I don't think salt water is good for anything mechanical. And it's starting to come up, and, um, you know, if it stalls the engine, you're in trouble. You might think, well, I'll just hop out and walk back. No, no, you probably won't. You probably won't make it. You'll get hypothermia. You're too far out. You'll slip and slide and fall in the water, and it's freezing. You, you just, you're toast. You're cold, cold toast. Uh, and, and I was also concerned that that water would start pouring into the passenger compartment. Uh, praise God, we had a good driver, and he got us out of there. Another time, we were trying to cross the bay to get to a church on the other side, and it was spring. And at a certain point in the spring, it gets warm enough that the ice is too soft to travel on, and they close the bay. On this particular day, I think already five vehicles had gone through the ice into the water. And foolishly, we persuaded this driver to take us across, because we'd come a long way to get there. And the most telling comment was uh, when we got to the other side, and get the picture, these, these, uh, these Vistaha drivers are big, tough, rough, burly Russian guys, uh, Polarniks, they're mujiki, <laughs> they're tough. And uh, I heard him say in Russian when we got to the other side, not much scares these guys. And he said, desit minut straka, which means 10 minutes of fear. So I'm thinking, with my lightning fast mind, oh, if that worried him, maybe I should have been a little worried about it. Um, so we made it, thank God. But you know what? Nobody's ever done what Jesus did. Think about Jesus. And he didn't just spend 10 minutes in a Vizdahad. He spent six hours in tortured agony on a Roman cross because of you. And you know, the people that mocked him said, if you are the son of God, come down from that. And do you know they were right in one respect? He could have. He could have come down. The only thing that held him up there was love. And, and unlike me, he didn't do that ignorantly. He did it knowingly. He knew what he was in for, and he walked into the teeth of that storm straight on. Thank God. We ought never forget that, that our sins have been forgiven at what price. It, it is the fuel for sanctification. Well, 
And you know, he didn't just risk plunging through ice. He plunged into the abyss of God's wrath. Unmitigated wrath poured out for you and for me. Well, after we, when we went to leave that town in the Arctic, I, I was sharing with you that, that the Lord made it plain that it was time for us to turn that work over. And, um, man, those people, really, they were our family, and we, we were theirs. They just adopted us. They adopted our children. They, they loved us. And so it was hard, as Mary said. It was really tough leaving them. It was like cutting your heart out and leaving it behind. And there was young, a young uh, gal there. She's about 20 years old. They, they, several of them went to the airport to see us off. And she said something to me. Um, she said, you're the only father I've ever known. And, you know, um, praise the Lord for Internet and Christian TV, but you can't do that over the Internet. There's some things like that little gal on Post Street. There has to be a body there intervene and you know 20 years later she still refers to me as her her father uh, but I think about Jesus if if he had not come to earth we would not know the father it, it wouldn't have been automatic you know that he chose to come and he didn't have to come it's not in the God contract that God had to save us. We get, we get that idea. We kind of think, well, he's obligated. He's God. That's what God does. Yeah. But he did not have to do it. He was, could be perfectly just and perfectly loving and not have saved this colony in rebellion, this, this place we call Earth. And, uh, you know, astronomers for years have, have searched for life on other planets and they're, they're listening for radio signals, but God didn't send radio signals. He sent his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And, and I think if he had not come, I would not know my heavenly father. If he had not died for me and sent his spirit, I could not cry, Abba, Father. It's not about us. No missionary has done what he's done. And he'd done it for everybody. Every one of us was a mission field, is a mission field. And people out there, their skin may be different, their food might be different, their clothes might be different, but I'm telling you, every human being that knows God is a sinner saved by grace. After we moved to the Russian Far East, as I mentioned, I was doing mission trips. And, and um, do you know what? In Bible school... You always end up praying. Sooner or later, you will pray, Oh, Lord, here I am. Send me. I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. Not my will, but thine be done. And that's a good prayer to pray. It's a really, really good prayer to pray. And if you pray that prayer, God may help you to make it real. Because I really wasn't planning on going three places. I've told you this before. Some of you may remember. There was three places I was not planning to go, even though I prayed that prayer. But I was not planning to go to India because it's hot in India. Okay, I'm in the Arctic. I liked cold then. I had grace to be cold. I don't anymore. I have grace to be warm, 90 degrees year-round in Singapore. But at that time, I did not want to go to India. It's hot in India, and they have Bad snakes in India. Cobras. And, um, you know, I was telling Pastor and Linda last night, one of the favorite testimonies I get from uh, one of the missionaries in Thailand is, I think he said every year we get testimonies of people who went to the outhouse, and after they got situated, they discovered there's a cobra in the outhouse with them. <laughs> and then their testimony is how... Jesus delivered them from the coba in the bathroom, you know. Man, can you imagine to see this flaring up in front of you? Ah. So I didn't want to go to India, and then I didn't want to go to Africa because it's hot in Africa, and they got very bad snakes in Africa. And then there was China. I had no intention of going to China because I was reading books about the Chinese believers and how these guys would preach the gospel, 
go to jail for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Their children grow up without them. They're separated from their families. And they come out. You know what they do? They go preach the gospel. And some of them get arrested again. And I remember reading this one of these books in, in my living room, and I just threw the book up in the air. I said, dear Lord, have mercy on me. What, what am I doing? What do, how, how can I call myself a missionary, let alone a Christian? And, and I did not want to get around those people. They convicted me. And I had no idea what I'm going to tell them. What, am I, what are you going to tell them about consecration, dedication to the will of God? You know? and, but God just made it plain. And that's the only place I've ever gone reluctantly. Because we're on our way in and, and our guide, who's Chinese, is telling us what, what the plan is if we get caught. It was a beautiful plan. It was run. <laughs> so, uh, but I did go to China. And, uh, and my, my dear wife even encouraged me, which, you know, you kind of think she would protect her husband. And, but, you know, Mary hears from God, and, and she said, I think you need to go. And so I went. And um, this one place we went, I mean, you talk about the underground church. This was literally underground. In that part of China, they build into the hills. And the, the, the meeting room was a big room, like a dome ceiling in the dirt, in the cave. And there was a separate sleeping room for the, for the ladies, a separate room for the men, and then a little hole in the back area where, again, they said, now, if, if we get raided, this is where you go. Great. Oh, and they would put a chest of drawers in front of that hole. Uh, the, 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 the bathroom was in an adjoining cave. And um, I'm telling you, this, 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 the smell in there, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but this is Mission Sunday. We're going to be real here. Um, it, it, was re it would be ridiculously easy to slip into that. It's just an open sewer pit. I won't go into detail, but it would have been real easy to slip into that. And boy, you, you do not want to be in that condition for four days. You're not going to have any fellowship with anybody in that state. And um, so, you know, but when we went to leave these people, they told me funny stories about what their mothers had told them. Their mothers had told them to, to eat all their food, clean their plate, and to think of all the starving children in America. And, and, um, and, and so, but when, when we went to leave, I mean, they were holding on to me like ch small children crying. And they were saying, we never thought anyone would come from so far away uh, to minister to us. But again, you know what? We all could say that. I think about Jesus, how he came from beyond the galaxies to this cosmic speck of dust that we call planet Earth uh, to show us what the Father is really like and to help us understand that he is God and we are not and that we needed to be saved. He came from far away. No one's ever done. No one's ever done for you what Jesus has done. And uh, lastly, I'll just share this with you. You know, of the, all the things, I, I, I think, I know Mary would agree with me. She said the hardest thing for us in the ministry was to say goodbye to the people in Providenia. But she was talking about in ministry. The hardest thing we ever had to do personally was say goodbye to our own kids as they got older and they left for you know, to go to college, and they went to military service. We have th three kids in the military. Um, uh, our daughter is a staff sergeant in the Air Force. Um, my, my son was a Marine in Afghanistan, and I've got another son who's been in anti-terrorism in the Coast Guard going to officer school now, or in January. And, but you know what? When we said goodbye to our kids, it wasn't like some of our friends who said, oh, we're so sad, you know, our child is going away to college. Where? Oh, 100 miles away. And, you know, she'll only get home every other weekend to do her laundry or something like that. And we're thinking, man, our kids are moving to another hemisphere. They're going to another continent. 
They're crossing the ocean. And, and it will, they were leaving. It was so final. And I think in 15 years, we've only all been together twice since that time. I'm not ashamed to say, you know, I wept. I knew it was the end of an era. I have never figured out the solution for goodbye. I don't know what the antidote is. It's, to me, the hardest word to say. The only antidote I know is to fi find your ho hope and life and love in Jesus because he's the only one that's constant and consistent. Who, who, you know, he's always there, always steady. And again, though, uh, we're not the only ones that say goodbye in life and in death. When Jesus went to the cross and he cried out, you know, we, we say it this way, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But scholars say he didn't say it that way. You know, up through the trial and the Garden of, e the garden of, Paradise, the garden of Gethsemane and, and the trial before Pilate, Jesus held it together. He was very, you know, he had the answer. He was cool, calm, and collected. But scholars say when he was on the cross and he cried out, my God, my God, I, I can't imitate. They said it was like a shriek. I don't know if you've ever heard anyone like that. I, I have. And you never forget it. He was being forsaken. The father was saying farewell. And it's easy for us to think, oh, well, but he's God. Which God is bad for him. Or, you know, he'll be raised from the dead in three days and everything will be all right. Listen, we just cannot comprehend mentally what it's like for an eternal God who has been eternally one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with infinite love, and for the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, to take upon himself sin that he had never known. Not one thought. Not one ill motive, not one hidden agenda, not, not any hypocrisy. But this God-man is pure and holy, and he takes upon himself the sin of billions and billions of people, and somehow in a way that we cannot understand, he experiences the punishment, the torment, and the eternal separation of billions of souls from his father. And the father never answers. Oh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The father doesn't answer. Maybe he could have said, well, you know, my son, I, I'm forsaking you so that I can forgive them. I am judging you so that I can justify them. I am rejecting you so that I can accept them. No missionary, nobody, not no one has ever done that for you. What, what have we done? greatest missionary who ever lived to Jesus. You know, he's crossed the thin ice. He's, he's braved the briny deep. He's faced fierce storm and foe. He's plunged into the abyss for you and for me. And uh, no hardship was too great. No torment was too painful. Uh, nothing was too much to stop his love for you. Certainly not your sins and our sins and our mistakes. Um, you know, if you belong to Christ, I'll close with this. Your life is not all about you. Your past and your future are not all about you. And maybe you've made some mistakes. You certainly have. If you're breathing, you've made mistakes. And some big, some little, but uh, you might look back and, and feel bad, but it's not about you anymore. Uh, it's about him. It's not about what you've done. It's about what he's done. It's about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, you know, even in our ignorance and half-baked condition, he chooses to use us inexplicably. He uses us, but, and he works in spite of us. 
so he gets all the glory. Aren't you glad? Aren't you happy about that? You know, so you're not saved by your works. You're saved on two good works. As we remember, as Peter said, the forgiveness of our sins. That would pass. As we feed on that, that's not something you just think about once in a while. You, you, it's always in you, with you, or, or it ought to be. That's how we have communion with God. And so, uh, you know, if you belong to Jesus, it's, it's not all about you. But I have to tell you, if you do not belong to Jesus, if you don't know him, unfortunately, it, it is all about you and just you. You are all you've got. You're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean holding on to a capsized rowboat and the typhoon is coming. If you don't know him, then it's all about what you've done. It's all about your own holiness and your own, your own works. And friend, they are never enough. Jesus said, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That means all day, every day, every thought, every word, every motive, every action, every reaction, every intention, always, everywhere, all day, every day, perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And no one has ever done that except Jesus. But when you belong to him, when you receive Jesus, his life becomes yours. His works become yours. His righteousness becomes yours. And you are saved. And you can look forward to an eternity in heaven with those Russians who prayed with Jesus so many years ago and all the people all over the world who are being saved. And you can look back to the past. You can look at your life and you can say, because of Jesus, I've lived a perfect life. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for Jesus. And I, I ask you, Lord, that you would plant a seed in my heart, in all our hearts, to always, always be mindful of what he did. How he's freed us from guilt and shame. How he took all everything upon himself, all the failure, all the ruptures, all the fractures in life, the good, the bad, the ugly, took it upon himself and he gave us a perfect life and perfect righteousness and eternal life. And Lord, I pray that if there be anyone in this room today who does not know you, that they would today. And I pray for the believers, the Christians, those who have received you, that they would be baptized afresh in the knowledge of what Jesus Christ has done for us, that we might bear fruit, godliness, steadfastness, faithfulness, brotherly affection, love, and that our faith would not be ineffectual as we remember what Christ has done for us. And I, I want to pray with you and ask you, if you, if you have never prayed this prayer, to pray it with us. And those that are Christians, would you pray this with me out loud? Let's make a confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, all who call on the name of the Lord. So easy. All who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and, and if, you, if you don't know Jesus, what are you waiting for? You, you don't know how long you have to live on this planet. You don't know. We were just driving the other day and just going through a normal intersection and somebody ran a light, hit the car by us, and if, if I had not kept rolling, they would have slam-banged right into us. You just don't know. It's so easy. Would you pray with me but let your heart agree? Would you pray with me to let your heart agree? And saints of God, those that are Christians, ask God to make the blood, the forgiveness, what Jesus did on the cross so real, so real. We never reach a point where we know it all. If anyone ever tells you, well, about the Bible or truth in the Bible, well, I know that already. 
you can just mark it down. They don't. If you ever think that, you don't. You don't know it as you ought to because if you did, when you hear truth, you would rejoice. Let's pray. Would you pray with me out loud? Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you he died for my sins. Lord Jesus, you are my Lord. I call on your name. I confess that I'm a sinner, that you have died for my sins. Forgive me for all my sins. Come into my heart and into my life, to my mind and soul and body. Come and live in me. Make me your child in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for it. And Father, open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your word. And everybody said, Amen. I'll finish with this. If you have, if this is the first time you've ever prayed that prayer, there are church leaders who will be down up front. Come down, talk to them, and just share with them what you've done. And they will have some information for you that will be helpful to you in your walk with God. Pastor Rick, God bless you. Thank you for everything. Praise the Lord.